Okay, so um, apparently I've got to be quick because I was thinking I was going to be doing quite a long talk, but anyway. Um, I'm going to be talking about captioning. Um, I know that we've been talking about sequence to sequence. The captioning is kind of just something to sequence. So the question is, can we generate just a list of stuff coming off essentially an image? Um, I'm going to go through some of the basics very quickly. Um, I'm going to need people to put their hands up when relevant. Um, I've been doing uh, like machine learning, startups, finance in New York for a long time. Uh, nine, 2014, I moved here. I had a fun year. And basically, I was just doing machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, a bit of robots, a bit of drones. Since 2015, I've been working with a fine local company doing serious natural language processing, deep learning. Um, I've written a couple of papers, and I've been having fun doing this kind of stuff. So, um, Quick outline. Um, I'm going to talk about the tools that we use, dense networks, CNNs, RNNs, embeddings. Just go over it very quickly. Um, I'll then talk about what the captioning problem is. Um, I'll talk about what sequence learning involves, talk about embeddings. Now, in fact, what I started out to do was to make this whole talk about how I would play around with the embeddings. What can I feed in? What can I pull out? What would work best? Because I, I kind of find the 27,000 neurons output as kind of an embarrassment. It would be nicer to do something a bit cleaner in, in my mind. But anyway, unfortunately, that stuff just didn't work. So on the other hand, what has, did happen is that apart from the LSTM or the standard sequence to sequence model, I decided to let's do something with CNNs because there's a nice deep mind paper, which was kind of, I guess, November. That, that would be an interesting thing to do. Having done that, there was a nice Facebook paper maybe a month ago of attention with CNNs. So I was like, OK, I'll do that too. And then last Thursday, um, Google came out with an, a great paper called Attention is All You Need. So I just had to do that. So it's turned, this talk has turned away from the embedding thing which was kind of an itch I wanted to scratch to a let's do some like the most state of the art models. So uh, there could be a demo with the voiceover, though I may well run out of time. Uh, all this code is in GitHub, open source. You may see quite a few updates a day. Um, that is it. Is what, what, quite, a, quite a few updates a night. So quick review. This was done previously in some of our, our meetups. Um, on Red Cat Labs in the presentations folder, there's, there's always stuff to, um, to look at. If you go, you, you'll find it. Um, so quick show of hands, does everyone know what this slide means? Does everyone know what one neuron does? Yes? OK. We're going to combine them into multiple layers. Does everyone understand this? Right? The trick is, how do you train these hidden layers? That's pretty tricky. You've got your inputs, and you've got what your outputs are. How do you train the bits in the middle, which you don't know what they should be? So has, any, has everyone played with this TensorFlow playground? Yes, quite a lot of nodding heads. OK. If you haven't, this is very cool. Basically, this is a Google thing, JavaScript. It allows you to put, play around with some inputs on this side. Here's your desired outputs on the other side. And then you can just fiddle around with how much stuff in the middle you can press the big training button, and off you go. It works very nicely. So the main takeaways from all that, so that was the introduction to dense networks. Okay? What we're trying to do is we're predicting output for a given input. We train it by using tons of pairs of input and outputs together. And we're going to play a blame game. So basically, this is gradient descent. This is the application of the chain rule. Um, when we have an error in our output, we're going to say, well, why did I get that error? and then adjust all the weights through the network to try and fix up the error. So the next time I get the same input, I get something close to the right output. I'm going to do that tons of times. Tons meaning millions, hundreds of millions. Um, that's gradient descent. The neat thing about these deep networks, which never used to work, is they, they create these features. So this is something where, in order to, do, to create the answer or the output properly, I would really like to have some higher level features. So in the sense, the, the English sentence input needs to be converted into this meta language vector. And now I can do something with it. And to do that, you have to, ha have to be able to get to higher levels, which 
evidently linguists can't do as well as machines now. So processing images. So this is my introduction to CNNs. When you've got an image, the images are kind of organized. So the idea is, well, let's make the whole image the feature. And what will apply is something like Photoshop filters. So the mathematical term for this is a convolutional kernel. CNNs are convolutional neural networks. This is a picture. Is everyone familiar with this picture? Basically, we're applying a little kernel all over this picture, the same little kernel everywhere. So instead of having lots of individual weights, this one kernel will, will scan the whole image, essentially converting a picture of a cat into a picture of a cat with highlights. So there's a little tool here. You can play around with that. OK, that's my introduction to convolutional networks. Processing sequences. The thing here is that variable length input doesn't really fit into any of these previous things. So we're going to run a network for every time step, but use the same network at every time step. So when we learn one of these mappings for something near the end, we're going to apply that same thing all across space, all across time. When you actually run this network, we're going to pass along some kind of internal representation that it makes up all for itself. These are kind of high-level features which it considers as time-wise. The idea is that if you can train this enough, it's going to learn features that are useful, and it's going to do that because you can still differentiate everything. So here's a picture of a basic RNN, which, as Sam said, this is basically you use one network and feed back this internal state to itself. And the way it looks when you roll it out is you're putting your inputs here, which is how are you, question mark, and your outputs are, you know, interrogative, whatever, a verb, whatever. It could be, basically, this is a one-to-one -one mapping of, it could be part of speech, it could be ner, it could be... But the question is, for this, how do we produce something which isn't a one-to-one -one mapping? Now, each of those little boxes where I said R and N, in fact, I'm going to be using GRUs, which are gated recurrent networks, which are composed themselves of lots of little boxes. There ends the lesson on recurrent neural networks. Okay. Word embeddings. This was a major advance in 2013. Basically, the idea, has everyone heard of word embeddings? Does anyone need this? Everyone seen this? Basically, if you scan text, words that are close together in the text should be somewhat similar to each other. So you initialize a huge random vector for every word in your vocabulary. And for every word within the wind, close to the window, you nudge them together. Every one which isn't, you nudge them apart. You keep iterating until it's good enough. This may take hours or days. The cool thing is that this vector space self-organizes. And for instance, if this, you can produce a very nice visualization using TensorBoard, um, which you can go back and have a look at our RNN thing, which was last month. Basically, it will, you know, similar words will be in similar space, places in this vector space. Uh, basically, this is the first step you'll do for basically any language task because you don't want to put, well, you may want to put characters in, but even if, but words are a good unit of, of thing. And if you can put these into a pre-made pre known vector space, so much the better. It's also possible to work with characters. But even with characters, it helps to have a character embedding. But I digress. That's embedding. So here is the task we're going to play with. The idea is we're going to take an image, and we're going to try and generate a caption. And here are some sample captions, which is, so this is, oh, it's even more obvious on here. So here's a dog. Here's a bush, here's a car, here's a hose, here's a stream of water, here's a hose on the green grass, right? And so this, these are human-generated captions, a large brown dog running away from the sprinkler in the grass, a brown dog chases the water from... So these are produced by humans. This is what a good caption would look like. And what I'm using here is a data set called Flickr30k. Basically, you've got 30,000 images all annotated by humans. And they've got about five decent captions for every one of them. And it's downloadable for free, but I can't hand it out um, because you need to send them for an email link, whatever. It's, there is a, this is the paper. You can find it on the web pretty easily, but not on torrent. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I need some, in order to, to featureize this, to, to move this into something which I can handle, I'm going to featureize the image here. 
And basically, I'm going to use Google's Inception V3. Now, this is something where you can pull down a model. It's, this is a big CNN. Basically, you put in your picture at the beginning. It chugs through this. And you get, essentially, particularly if you cut it off here, you get something like 2,000 features out of this. Or 2,000, this, this whole image turns into 2,048 numbers. And that is enough to do the classification task or whatever. But we don't want to do classification. We're just going to use that as the truth about the image. Um, for text, um, what I want to do so I, here is, I'm, because I wanted to look not at the, like an industrial scale kind of application, I wanted just to get some nice results, I'm going to make sure that all the captions are learnable. So I'm only going to use captions which are, have common enough words. So I'm going to throw away every caption which has a word which doesn't have five images associated with it. So if there's only one image of someone in a kimono, uh, I'm going to throw away that image entirely because I, I won't ever be able to learn enough about kimonos to, to do it. On the other hand, with 30,000 images, I think kimono's probably in the vocab. So, um, so there's well, also why I require all words to be in this glove 100,000 word type thing. And I also want to make sure that all the stop words, which are really common words at the beginning, now, I'll explain why. Um, so, well, I will, yes, I will explain why. So, sorry, and I didn't point out. So here you can see a link. There's, there is in my deep learning workshop, which is on GitHub, in this CNN, I'll explain why, captioning thing, there is a, fold, there's a folder images to features, which will just featureize every image you have in, in a folder and just produces a nice blob of data for you to load in. Similarly, there's something which will just take all these captions, throw away stuff, build the embedding, and give you, hand you back a vocab with everything in the right order, all these things just kind of laid out. Because I, I, it simplifies the next step a lot, because then you can just load this stuff and it's ready to, ready to go. So what I want to do here is now explain the things which I didn't, didn't get to, um, sequences from networks, explain the word by word, which I do for testing, teacher forcing, training. These are things you've heard before from Sam. I'm just, I'm a glutton function. Embedding choices, which I did want to talk about, but um, it's not going to work. So generating sequences. Basically, here we have some, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put in somehow these image features at the beginning. Their magic will occur in this box. I will kick off this thing with a start symbol. And it will then pop out something like word one. I will then take that word one and say, well, I actually mean word one. Pop it in. More magic occurs. I get word two. Keep going. Eventually get to stop. At which point, that's the end of my output. And my output will be word one, word two, to end. So this is when at test time, basically, you can. this is the, the run you go through. But at training time, Actually, I know the, the caption that I want, and I know the features from the image. So basically, I've, I've got known at the, known at the left-hand side. I've got known stuff at the bottom. And I actually know what the word should be for the loop just by shifting my inputs over by one. Right? So because of that, I've got a fully known network. I can just, oh, sorry, I've got a fully known, like, everything around the edges. So I can just force all the weights to converge to what they should be to make, it, to make the magic work simultaneously. This speeds things up. So here's a quick thing about the embedding choices. You can think about word vectors, which we've talked about. You can think about one hot embeddings, which is you just have a number which, or a position within a, in a vector, which is the word. Or you could actually numeric. It should be numeric index. So basically, you could just say, I want the number 28 to be the output of my network. I don't want to say it's the 28th vector position. I just want the number 28, maybe in binary. Um, let me just quickly, one hot. Oops. There we go. So word vectors, OK, fixed dimensions, great. Independent vocab size, good stuff. Stop. The problem with stop words is you might get a very murky embedding, because the embedding for the is kind of in between lots of words. What, what is the, really? Um, or it's cat should be near feline and dog and, 
I don't know, burglar, right? But the is, is something different. So maybe a pure word vector for the is going to be very difficult to guess. Also, these action words like start and stop and unk, I'm, I'm never actually going to have an unk by construction, but, um, but the padding, I, I've got to have some kind of embedding for that. I've got to make it up somehow. Um, but these things are often used as an input stage by, by many people. The one hot thing, if I've got a vocab of 7,000 words, which is what I have here, um, I've got to have a vector which is 7,000 long. Um, it's a very large number of things which are going to be like 1 and 0, or mainly 0. Often used as an output stage, basically the index of my word is going to be the, the max arg of a soft max function. So this is the keras kind of thing that you'll be doing. Now this is kind of crazy. If I could actually output just the number of the word, I could do this, I would only need 14 outputs to cover 7,000 um, vocabulary. So it's difficult to believe this could possibly work, because how could 14, instead of 7,000 options, I've got 14 things. I have to get it exactly right. If I get any digit wrong, I've got completely the wrong word. Um, but it does work, because there's some Japanese guys who published a paper maybe a month ago that made it work. Um, it's insane. They added some error correcting code. Um, I, would, I would love this to work anyway. Th th so this is what it kind of attracted me to doing this, let's tr test out the embedding. So wouldn't it be cool to not have 7,000 outputs? I would love to have 14 outputs. Right? Or we could do some combo. And this is kind of where I ended up. Basically, you'd have uh, a one hot encoding over the action and stop words at the beginning. And then I'd ha have slap a uh, word embed, a 50 dimensional word embedding at the end, just concatenate them. I'm going to use that as my, my input stage. So basically, if I say the, it's going to be one hot you know, position 20. But if I say kimono, it's going to say I'm going to use the extra embedding, which is there's going to be an extra uh, position six will be use the extra stuff. And then, then would, the kimono will be in the, the embedding at the end. So let's just do some. Um, some extra machinery, because I said I'm going to be doing some new networks. Who's heard of dilated CNNs? Yes? Yes, yes, okay, some, some. Um, batch norm? Some, some, yeah. Um, residual connections? Okay, we're kind of moving through time in a way. Gated linear networks? Gated, no, gated linear units? Yes? No, probably not. It's more different. Fishing nets? Now, actually, that was a test question, because fishing nets are used by fishermen. <laughs> so, attention is all you need layer. Okay, this is pretty new. This was um, announced last week on Thursday. So, dilated CNNs. This is a thing from DeepMind. They announced this WaveNet paper um, less than six months ago now, so, or maybe no. um, Basically, you can find this in Keras with this dilation rate. Um, Basically, instead of having a convolutional layer which just looks at a little patch, you actually expand the patch by having gaps in it. So here you're just looking at you know, patches just below here. Sorry, this one looks at patch directly underneath it, side by side. But as you move up here, it's looking at wider and wider strides. The point of doing this is that if you look at the receptive field behind this neuron, it's actually getting exponentially big. Now, why would you want to do that? If you just had a regular CNN, basically the receptive field gets big, just as how many layers you have, the receptive field gets that big. Here, you would have basically two to the n kind of receptive field. So if you want a really big receptive field, you might want to do this. And when would you want to do a really big receptive field? When you've got a lot of history. And when might you have a lot of histories when you use sequences and you don't want to use recurrent neural networks? Okay, batch norm. Um, we, Sam talked about the, the activation and parameter explosion problems um, if you've got very deep networks. Um, one way you can solve this is just to add a new layer which learns to scale your activations. So basically it tries to squash the layer into just being like a mean zero standard deviation one. Um, in Keras, there's a function, batch norm. You slap it in there. It will fix it up for you. So there's another idea. And so basically, it takes over a whole batch. It learns to fix the batches up so they're all of the right mean and variance. But doing that means that um, 
you never have a weight which will never have an activation which will be always zero because it will always been blown up to be into a decent range so it's much easier to learn from there's other things called layer norm uh, Cholet has chosen not to do that yet um, residual connections this is a thing from Microsoft in their ResNet paper which was probably a year ago um, maybe 18 months Basically, the idea, and so that people are playing around with this thing. Basically, now these skip connections are very common. What you do is you have your input layer, and then you have what you would ordinarily have, like a ton of stuff happens to it. And then, well, instead of just giving the answer, you add back the input layer with a huge skip. You just add them together. So it's either, if I'm, if I'm now training this thing, which will be going backwards, it would allow me to skip my, skip my training down through this really easily, because this is just a one wire, and also train this network. So the nice thing about these residual connect, that these, these kind of residual skip connections is it allows you to do much deeper networks without having um, the multiplicating, <coughs> multiplicating weights problem, because you can always just miss out the layer and get back to the earlier and earlier stages. Gated linear units. Oh, it hasn't turned out so well. Okay. Basically, you've got this is a um, Facebook used this, so this is why I'm explaining it um, in their convolutional thing. You have your input, you form two new layers, and you either use the layer with a linear activation or you squash it with a sigmoid thing. And then you just multiply them together. So you basically, you've got your, your input is split into two different kinds of stuff. And then it can kind of switch itself on and off. This is kind of funky, but it works. So that's why people are using it, particularly for natural language. Now, here's the thing from last week. Uh, attention is all you need layers. Basically, and, and this is, it, it gets kind of complicated. So Sam explained that you would have a 30 step by 100 value um, input for your one sentence. So each position would have a value of, of, of 100 things. Right? What I would like to do is choose what position I'm using and what, what should I pass up to the next layer, which will then also have 30, 30, 30 word positions and 100 dimensions, but I want to know which one to promote up. Now, it may be that I just want to copy it, in which case I would say, choose this one, choose this one, choose this one, choose this one. But what these guys do is they, they convert the 100 layer also into a query and a key value. Now, the key value says, how much does do, what is this word about? And the query is, what do I want in my position to feed up? And so you then essentially do a big matrix multiply of all the queries with all the keys and then softmax and then feed up where it is. Now basically this is, a, is, is giving you attention over your input feeding up to the next layer. Now this is something where you have to read the paper several times to, <laughs> to see what on earth is going on. So the reason it's called an attention is all you need layer is that they don't really have anything else in the network. They have attention on attention on attention. These things are just looking up each other. Um, all the words look at all the words. They manipulate whatever they need and feed it through. Um, not only do they do this, so that's the simple version, but then they have this multi-head attention, whereby each le this single layer, actually you have multiple heads, multiple queries, passing up multiple versions of V, and then you just slap them all together. Um, the crazy thing is, so having once you've implemented it, which I've now done in Keras, which I guess is the first time in anywhere, um, because no one else has had a chance, right? Um, once it works, it just kind of works. You just slap it in as a layer. There we go. So um, this is very hot off the press. Now, even though by LSTMs are state of the art everywhere, um, these guys would claim that it's not no longer true. Anyway. This is why I want, it's turned, this has turned into a models uh, day. So here's some network pictures. Um, basically, this is a GRU thing. So this is the, the basic network. Um, so I've got, my notebook has four different models in it. Um, this is the GRU version. Basically, you take your inputs, you pop this into some, a bunch of GRUs, 
200 wide. And outputs, you're going to get a soft max, your know, argmax kind of one hot thing to give you a word. You then pop this word in here. Da, da, da. This is Cruise. Network two. This is a this is the deep mind like thing with the dilated CNNs. Basically, I'm going to treat the sentence not like a, a recurrent thing. I'm going to treat it like a picture, and just do this using CNNs only. So the whole thing is a picture. I'm mapping words to words as a picture. Um, it doesn't sound like it should work. That's why I wanted to try. Um, network picture three. So this is using the Facebook thing which they fixated on, which was this gated linear units. So instead of using CNNs, I use whole r rafts of CNN-powered gated linear units. Um, so let's see, it's kind of radically simplified, but this is another thing. Okay. Network picture four. So this is basically the, the layout of the Google translation thing. So they were putting in, I think, English and getting out French. Um, they would take in their English sentence, apply some kind of clocks onto it. I didn't mention clocks. And then this thing would just attend to itself a lot and then output some uh, like an, uh, a field of stuff that might be attended to by the other thing. And this is the output, and this is just one flow through. So instead of having like recurrence or anything, this is just <coughs> upwards from the bottom. They would have six bunches of these layers. It was in order to get to state of the art, this is a pretty complicated thing. On the other hand, once you built the modules, you just glue them together. This has got way fewer parameters than these other models. Um, what I'm going to show here is basically well, I, I, I've got a picture, so I didn't need this thing. Um, I only tried one layer. So you can try two layers. You, anyway, so this is the stuff which works. It's basically my GPU has been running continuously for the last week, trying to get more and more results out. Um, and I can do a quick walkthrough, but let me just. Da, 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 okay, let me. I can do. I can do a walkthrough, except it's probably getting late. I think it's getting quite late. Basically, and we're also this is partly to do with what we're going to do next time. Is that they're, they're going to probably have a tips and tricks kind of session. There's a ton of tips and tricks in this notebook. Um, I can whiz you through it just to prove that I did do something for today. Um, and let me let me do that right now. It's online, so you can you can have a look yourself. Um, just hold on there. So this is what the da, da, da. so I've it has some actually has some documentation. This is crazy. Um, can you see this? Yes. So basically, because because I've saved all this stuff, all the caption stuff off, I can load it in in one go. Here's all the features. I can load this all in one go. And then. This, basically, I've got a ton of imports, because Keras for the win. And I can th and then start to create this I.O. stages. So this is where I want to play around with the different embedding styles. So what I've done is I created some, da, 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 some representation classes. So basically, this allows me to pass in a class which has encode losses and decode functions in it. So this means that I can kind of abstractly pass in what I want as my embedding, and, and the network will just do it. Um, because I wanted to make it pluggable, because I wanted to try every kind of embedding in with every kind of embedding out and fiddle around with this. Um, the code's all there. Um, does it, it, and it does work, um, but does it work? Not, not so much. So. Um, I got some interesting results. So basically, I've got some test code just to make sure that what you pass in, and then if you encode something, can it be decoded for this one embedding? There's, there's also there's a lot of subtleties associated with this. So, um, so now let's go on to the models. So here is essentially the RNN captioner. So this is captioning based upon recurrent neural networks. And I just have an RN is a GRU, and then I output a time distributed dense. So basically, this is making the right kind of thing. I do one layer of GRUs. I could have multiple layers of GRUs, whatever. So 
there's, it's a, by, by modularizing it like this, the actual models turn into pretty simple code. Um, so this CNN with dilations thing, this is the DeepMind paper. Basically, there's some features, stuff, stuff, stuff. Basically, the, the core of it, we've got this kind of CNN is the conv1d of CNN. Da, 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 lots more, lots more. Piles and piles of CNNs. All with this kind of dilation factor over here. Oh, you can't even see it. Honestly, there's a dilation factor. So you can see that these dilation rates, I'm doing this kind of, I have a, a single word at a time, or skipping words, or four, word by fours, or word by eights. But it's only really not words at that point, it's creating new, new features that it wants. OK, here's another one. This is to do with the gated linear units. Basically, you can see it's got the A and the B. It multiplies them together. There's a residual thing. There's a bit of batch normalization. And then I use this thing for a captioning thing. Basically, I take this and I dilate it and I add them up. And it may seem scientific, <laughs> but it didn't happen that way. So, okay. um, attention is all you need. So basically, there's this attention layer is a bit of a uh, brain strain. But then once you have this attention is all you need captioner, you just say, I want an attention layer. And I will then residual and norm it. So the nice thing about Keras is it encapsulates all this stuff really nicely. And if you write this stuff, I haven't delved into TensorFlow at all. I have zero TensorFlow um, dependency in here. Um, and in fact, the Keras embedded in TensorFlow lags too much to be used for this. So you need to use separate Keras um, because, because Keras. Um, I think I think Cholet is, is pretty badly uh, uh, over pressured with with stuff to do. So fair enough. Okay, so having defined my four different models, I can now plug them in. Basically, here's my embedding idea. What I wanted to say the the whole reason for doing the embedding um, classes at the top was so I could say, here's my embedding input and my embedding output should be a one hot with embedding and a full one hot. So I just wanted to be able to say, here's what my embedding style is. So I could then flip it around if I wanted. Right? And I can then, here's my model choice. So basically, here's a, bit of a, here's a bit of a thing. So basically, I can choose a model. They all have the same input output. And I have this model, da, 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 compiles it, produces samples, captions. Let's just let's run. Mm, OK. Let's not run it because you, you'll, you'll see. Maybe if I just I'm gonna go up to above here. Okay, while well, that's cooking. Okay. So here is an untrained network. Um, you'll see that its its first output is cables burning gracefully, pin shine, soups arranged, marshy solar boards briefs. So this is not a very good description of the image. Um, so, so I'll just do the models in order. Basically, uh, here's my typical training regime. So I've got a 141 dimensional input for my stop words and action words with a 50 dimensional embedding. So it's 191. My output is going to be this 7,000 vocabulary softmax. Internally, I'm going to standardly use like 200 width stuff, 200 layers of CNNs, sorry, 200 um, channels of CNNs, but then a whole bunch of layers, depending on which model I'm running. Um, I don't actually play around with the learning rates at all, because that seems too enthusiastic to me. Um, 50 epochs of this, so 50 runs through all 30 or 150,000 images, uh, 150,000 image caption pairs takes about three and a half hours on my now two year, one year old, two year old Titan X. So um, I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, on the laptop, one epoch takes four hours. So, so here's the Groove version. A black dog running on a park. Two big dogs play ball across the grass. So, okay, you'll see. 
a bog chases a ball while a man in a vest holding a hand. Okay, so it's got so clearly this thing knows something about something, right? But sorry, this is a test image, so it's never seen this image before, and it, it learnt to do this in four hours. So it's gone from zero in zero. Its only knowledge of in English language is like what words are similar to each other. Its only knowledge of images is which image net class does this belong to, but not even that because I stripped those away. So from just some numbers to 2,000 numbers from an image and a whole bunch of numbers on the words, it learnt to write these sentences, which is kind of cool, in four hours. So okay. here's another one. So this is the dilated CNN. A brown dog is standing on a yard. So, so I, I've got a ton of training data. I can see how these performed kind of numerically. One dog bites another baseball player who's found behind in the background. <laughs> okay. Two dogs at Vaughan Park. Okay, so this, has got, this is a bit more consistent that it knows about the dog and the park and the running and the playing. Um, so winter grass, I don't understand what's got that from. Okay. The gated linear unit one. So this is kind of like a like Facebook. Grey dog is running on a grass field. A dog jumping over a bush. I don't see the bush, but it's, it's got some good ideas, right? A dog on a leash is near a fountain. So now it's picking up actually more things. A brown dog is running through the muddy rain is kind of interesting. A one dog with a brown jacket is playing on a coast. Okay. So, but I'm also saying that this is without any language model. So this is just raw, this is the five first things that it came to mind at random. So if I had a language model, some of this stuff would look wrong and it would just say throw away these things or if I had like beam search or something. A lot of these papers don't mention too much the beam search and stuff that they're doing. I mean, it's a small detail, but it cleans up these models like a lot. So um, the attention is all you need. Uh, I wish this worked better, but it doesn't quite yet. So two dogs play in the grass. Uh, I, my guess is it thinks this is a dog, but anyway. <laughs> two dogs race by the two dogs fighting to a grassy yard. Uh, brown dogs leave beside fire. Okay. So here it hasn't got the idea about the water at all, whereas the other one had... So at the moment, Facebook is in the lead with their gated linear units. Um, there we go. So as a wrap-up, so uh, this whole session was more challenging than we did before. So this is, sorry, just in general, because um, we wanted to have like an advanced thing. The question is, um, if, you're, if you're a beginner who's kind of like, whoa, um, do come back because the, often the beginner stuff is more targeted to you, right? On the other hand, if you thought that was so cool, we need more of that thing, then yes, we should do more of that thing. You should tell us whatever. Um, if you're so into it that you read these papers and want to research, then there's really cool guys who are starting a PyTorch meetup that might be interesting to you. But I can't really talk about that here. I didn't mention it, in fact, because it's not TensorFlow. Um, there's tons of innovation going on in natural language processing. Um, so LSTMs seem so last year now. Um, this, this stuff seems so cool, but you know, who knew CNNs could be used for all this stuff? Um, and then attention everywhere, that's even more crazy. Um, but having a GPU is, you need a GPU. Um, you can definitely use fantastic GPUs or TPUs that cloud, Google will offer you in a cloud. Um, but you'd certainly need to spend money on that, or you can spend money on an NVIDIA card. Maybe AMD will help soon, don't know about that. Um, a lot of deep learning people will have just something sitting beside the desk to keep the room warm, and then when they're ready for real production, they'll, they'll put it into the cloud. Um, this, my stuff is all on, on my GitHub. Um, for this, my KPI is please add a star, I'd love the star. Uh, and questions. Okay, let's go for questions. Go. Um, yeah. No, no, just one caption at a time. So. Oh, I just generate five examples because it's five is more more illuminating than one. That's all. Yes. Yes. So basically, I've got a, each, at the top of each of these is a soft max. So while I'm trying to, to, during training, I'm trying to force it to the correct word, 
during testing, I've never seen the, the input before. I've, I have no idea. So I start with the word start. And then I say, well, what word do I feel like next? And there'll be a distribution amongst the words. Maybe A. A is a very common first word, say, or two. In, is, seems like a common word. But basically, it'll, make a, it'll flip a coin between A and two, and then say, OK, I chose A. Then I say, OK, if I chose A as my first word, what's my second word? And so I keep flipping coins amongst the softmax. And if it's determined to do one particular word, it's an easy choice. But some, sometimes it doesn't know what much. And then I get really huge variety. The, one of the problems is if you don't get much variety, it might just say concrete, 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 concrete. Because the, if, if the word following concrete is concrete, then it will just keep saying it again and again. So there's some interesting failure modes in here. But yeah. Does that? Yeah. So sometimes you don't choose the no, I, I just, I just essentially like I do a weighted Monte Carlo kind of thing. I just, it may pick an extremely unlikely word. It's, it's extremely unlikely. Anything else? Maybe I should. We'll do a kind of a gaggle thing, I guess. Um, I've got some announcements. So, the Deep Learning Meetup Group. If you don't know what this is, you should probably join it. Um, our next meetup is on the 20th of July. Um, we're going to do something like tips and tricks, just because doing this huge modeling exercise is, a, is huge, whereas tips and tricks, we've used these throughout, and so we can show you a ton of tricks and tricks. But also, all of you are probably doing something interesting which would have tips and tricks which everyone else would find interesting. We've had a fantastic talk today. There are lots of people doing playing around with this stuff. If you're enthusiastic, even if it's just you can maintain enthusiasm for five minutes. Everyone would, everyone would be happy about it, right? Um, and then you'd actually have on your resume, yes, I gave a talk at the Deep Learning, or TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore group. And we are apparently larger than London now. So um, we've done pretty well. In fact, everyone here has done pretty well. So. so I was going to say on Saturday we have a one day beginner thing. Um, 9.30 is when it's starting now, just in case anyone doesn't know. We'll be playing with real models. One question, this costs $15 just for lunch. But it's now full, so this is redundant. Um, the eight week deep learning course, I'm, we're embarrassed to keep saying July, but with no actual fixed numbers. This is going to be, um, we're desperate to make it happen, but we're also desperate to make it happen. So. We're um, thinking of an eight-week developer course. It would have three-hour sessions each week. Probably also have another clinic kind of session where it wouldn't actually be taught, but coming along with your laptops, we'd be there saying, why don't you try this? Because a lot of it's going to be project-based. And, and I'm not telling you the price, right? If that's your question. Okay, okay. Is it possible to reserve it in advance? Um, not until we know the price, I guess, right? <laughs> um, the, the idea here is the projects are kind of important because having structured products or university or Udacity, Udacity, all these things are fantastic, except that if you turn up to an employer saying, I did everything that was required of me, that's kind of lame. Whereas if you did, or it cackles, cackles pretty good because then you're actually on a world leaderboard, right? But, um, on the other hand, if you said, oh, I was really curious about my dog's feeding habits, and I built this neural network, and I feed her, and da 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 da, then you've actually done something. And you can talk so much more authentically about it. Um, so that's what we want people to do. We don't want people to have teamwork or thing. People need a project they want to do. It could be anything. As you've seen, you can do any crazy stuff with this stuff. Um, but then you'll really know it. And really knowing it's kind of the key to doing it like as a job. Um, if you want more information, there's redcatalyzer slash course. There'll be a form to fill in. Um, we may think about uh, putting some more structure around this, but this is kind of uh, to you know, watch here kind of thing. And this is not going to be easy. Um, it's also not, probably not going to be cheap, but as I expect to work hard, <laughs> we, we, we want to make it work. So, OK. Questions? And also home time. Maybe we should say, Go, go home, or stick around the front, and we'll 
because the speakers will be here and we'll answer questions. Okay, thank you very much.